So some of you may be wondering why a presidential library devoted to Herbert Hoover is interested in Laura Ingalls Wilder. Like John F. Kennedy's library that houses the papers of the writer Ernest Hemingway, we are the only presidential library to house the literary papers of a major writer. The Laurels, Laura Ingalls Wilder papers came to us through the estate of her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. Uh, Ms. Lane had written an early campaign biography of Hoover. When she died with no heirs, the executor of her estate saw the folder upon folder material dealing with Herbert Hoover and contacted the library. Of course, the archivists were interested and the collection was donated. Little did they know that it also contained important correspondence between Lane and her famous mother, as well as drafts of her mother's writings, including a version of her unpublished autobiography. For decades, Laura Ingalls Wilder fans have trekked to West Branch like pilgrims seeking the Holy Grail. <laughs> They've asked to see the big chief tablets that contain Wilder's drafts and our copy of the autobiography. We're indeed fortunate to have with us today Pamela Smith Hill, who has recently published the autobiography. Laura Ingalls Wilder, Pioneer Girl, the annotated autobiography, came out last fall and immediately sold out the first printing of 15,000 copies. It's now on the ninth printing and still selling strong. It took years of research examining the various drafts of Pioneer Girl in different repositories and then painstakingly providing the invaluable annotations to guide the reader through the thickets of various place names, individuals, and events. The result is a definitive work that will be cherished by all Little House readers. By happenstance, we happen to have a supply for sale <laughs> in our museum store, and the author has kindly consented to signing them for you. Uh, Pamela Smith-Hill was born and reared in the Ozarks, in part explaining her interest in Wilder. She grew up 40 miles from Rocky Ridge Farm, and as she explained, launched her writing career not far from DeSmet. She's the award-winning author of Laura Ingalls Wilder, A Writer's Life, and three historical novels for young adults, Ghost Horses, The Last Grail Keeper, and The Voice from the Border. Uh, Hill has taught creative writing at universities uh, of Oregon, Washington, and Colorado, as well as an online course on Laura Ingalls Wilder through Missouri State University. She's now working on several historical fiction novels for young adults. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pamela Smith Hill. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm really gratified and surprised to see such a full house. But then Laura Ingalls Wilder is a rock star, so I guess I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I also want to say, before I get started today, that the idea for Pioneer Girl originated here in the archive room at the Hoover. So it is especially gratifying to be back here today to talk about the book. Last summer, the Associated Press and Publishers Weekly broke the news that Pioneer Girl, Laura Ingalls Wilder's previously unpublished autobiography, was soon to be published. According to the Associated Press, the book was a more realistic, grittier view of frontier living. Associated Press reporter Kevin Burbach went on to say that the book included not safe for children tales, <laughs> and stark scenes of domestic abuse, love triangles gone awry, and a man who lit himself on fire while drunk on whiskey. <laughs> News outlets from across the United States and beyond, from the New York Times to National Public Radio, from the Christian Science Monitor to The Guardian in the UK, picked up the story. And by the time the book was published last November, reporters and most reviewers alike continued to focus on the dark side of Wilder's world. 
The headline from the Wall Street Journal, a grim house. <laughs> Was I surprised by the spin the media placed on Pioneer Girl? All this frenzy about the dark, disturbing scenes depicted in the autobiography? Frankly, yes. <laughs> because from my perspective, anyway, there is so much more to Pioneer Girl than what the Associated Press reporter described as those not safe for children tales. In fact, I had spent several hours talking to that AP reporter about so much more than the manuscript's grit and scandal. Why had he zeroed in on that aspect of Pioneer Girl? It was a relatively small part of the interview. The obvious answer, of course, is that popular culture thrives on grit and scandal. I should have known. <laughs> But beyond that, there was the implication that Wilder had whitewashed her life in the Little House books, that she had covered up the truth when she transitioned from the nonfiction of Pioneer Girl to the fiction of the Little House series. One reviewer from my hometown in Portland, Oregon, called this a glaring distortion. Certainly, Wilder made significant changes when she shifted from writing nonfiction to fiction, more about this later. But I came to realize as more stories and reviews about Pioneer Girl were featured in the national and international press, that much of the media's obsession over Wilder's dark side was related not to the Little House novels themselves, but to the television series. What you're seeing here is the front page of a French language newspaper published in Switzerland in December. A rough translation of the front page text here, the true history of Laura and the Little House on the Prairie. But notice, the photograph is of Melissa Gilbert, <laughs> the actress who played Laura on TV, not the real Laura Ingalls Wilder. To be fair, the newspaper later did include historical photographs of Laura. But the image of Melissa Gilbert appeared on the front page to heighten the contrast between the realities of Pioneer Girl and the fiction of Little House on the Prairie. And images of the TV series or references to it surfaced again and again when reporters and reviewers contrasted Wilder's real-world experiences in Pioneer Girl with the fictional ones. Why is this significant? Does it matter that reporters and reviewers are focused on the television series versus Wilder's books when drawing comparisons to Pioneer Girl? First, a few words about the television series. The television series, Little House on the Prairie, ran on NBC from 1974 until 1982, and the show remains in syndication today. It won Emmys for its cinematography and music, and TV Guide named one of the show's episodes to its list of 100 greatest episodes of all time. The show was incredibly popular and successful, but it is a highly reimagined interpretation of Wilder's original books. For one thing, there's the cast itself. <laughs> In general, the characters in the TV series are softer, more sentimental, less rough around the edges, less gritty than the fictional characters in Wilder's books. More about this in a minute. Even the setting is radically different. The TV family settles in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. Yet Wilder herself wrote just one book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, about the fictional family's experiences there. Both the real Ingalls family and the fictional one from the books moved to Dakota Territory, and Wilder set five of her nine books there. In fact, four of these five books were finalists for the coveted Newbery Award in children's literature. 
They are often considered Wilder's strongest books, and yet the setting of these books, along with many of their most memorable scenes and episodes, weren't part of the TV series. And the TV show took lots of liberties with the characters, scenes, and episodes from the books that they did include. Here's just one example. In real life, in Wilder's fiction, and in the TV series, Mary Ingalls lost her sight. And in fact, the real Ingalls family sent Mary to the College of the Blind in Benton, Iowa. She graduated from there in 1889. But unlike her television counterpart, portrayed by Melissa Sue Anderson, the real Mary Ingalls and the fictional character in the books never married. She lived out her life in South Dakota and the house Charles Ingalls built for his family there. The TV series gave Mary a happier, rosier, more conventional future. She falls in love and gets married on the television show. In general, the TV series casts a happier, rosier, and more conventional glow over all of Wilder's characters. Now, the TV series has become iconic in its own right, and in many ways appears to have overshadowed Wilder's books. When reporters and reviewers observe that Wilder's autobiography contrasts with the bright and sunny optimism of the Little House books, I suspect they're unconsciously referring to the TV show they may not be aware of scenes like this from the book. In On the Banks of Plum Creek, Laura is nearly drowned when she tries to cross the flooded creek. The scene, however, isn't simply about danger or disobedience. As you'll see in a minute, Laura doesn't learn from this episode that she should always obey her parents. Instead, she learns something darker, more subtle, even more sophisticated. <coughs> Let's take a look at this scene. Initially, the creek seems to laugh and call to Laura, beckoning her to come and play. So she clasps her hands on the plank and rolls onto it. In that very instant, she knew the creek was not playing. It was strong and terrible. It seized her whole body and pulled it under the plank. Only her head was out, and one arm desperately across the narrow plank. The water was pulling her, and it was pushing, too. It was trying to drag her head under the plank. Her chin held onto the edge, and her arm clutched, while the water pulled hard at the rest of her. It was not laughing now. No one knew where she was. No one could hear her if she screamed for help. The water roared loud and tugged at her stronger and stronger. Laura kicked, but the water was stronger than her legs. She got both arms across the plank and pulled, but the water pulled harder. It pulled, back the, it pulled the back of her head down, and it jerked as if it would jerk her in two. It was cold. The coldness soaked into her. This was not like wolves or cattle. The creek was not alive. It was only strong and terrible and never stopping. It would pull her down and whirl her away, rolling and tossing her like a willow branch. It would not care. Notice the line here, it would not care. The natural world is ambivalent. It doesn't care about Laura or any human endeavor. Nature isn't simply warm and sunny and beautiful in Wilder's books. It can be dangerous, cruel, and even deadly. How does the scene end? Laura escapes, and Ma hopes the incident will teach Laura a lesson, she says. Well, Laura, you have been very naughty, and I think you knew it all the time. But I can't punish you. I can't even scold you. You came near being drowned. Now, if the scene had ended here with the expected moral lesson, obey your parents, it would have been more conventional, perhaps the kind of episode many reporters and reviewers assume fill the pages of Wilder's Little House books. But this isn't where the scene ends. 
Laura did not say anything. <coughs> the creek would go down. It would be a gentle, pleasant place to play in again. But nobody could make it do that. Nobody could make it do anything. Laura knew now that there were things stronger than anybody. But the creek had not got her. It had not made her scream, and it could not make her cry. Laura is a very tough and unyielding little girl. She is unrepentant. She has grit in a world that is sometimes dark and ambivalent. Here's another scene from yet another little house book that speaks to the senior side of life. Another scene that might surprise those reporters and reviewers who think that Wilder books are consistently sunny and bright. The one I'm about to share with you comes from a little town on the prairie set in DeSmit, Dakota Territory, when Laura, as a teenager, is working in town, hoping her wages will help pay for Mary's college expenses. She makes buttonholes for Mrs. White, who lives and works in her son-in-law's store. His name is Mr. Clancy. So let's dive in and take a look at the scene. When the big man had gone on, Mr. Clancy asked Mrs. White when his shirts would be done. Mrs. White said she did not know which shirts they were. Then Mr. Clancy swore. Laura scrooged small in her chair. Think of that verb, scrooged. Brilliant, brilliant verb choice for all you writers out there. <laughs> Laura scrooged small in her chair, basting as fast as she could. Mr. Clancy snatched shirts from the pile and almost threw them at Mrs. White. Still shouting and swearing, he said she'd get them done before dinner or he'd know the reason why. I'll not be driven and hounded, Mrs. White blazed, nor, not by you nor any other shanty Irishman. Laura hardly heard what Mr. Clancy said then. She wanted desperately to be somewhere else. But Mrs. White told her to come along to dinner. They went into the kitchen behind the store, and Mr. Clancy came raging after them. Lunchtime, however, provides no relief. The kitchen was hot and crowded and cluttered. Mrs. Clancy was putting dinner on the table, and three little girls and a boy were pushing each other off their chairs. Mr. and Mrs. Clancy and Mrs. White, all quarreling at the top of their voices, sat down and ate heartily. <laughs> Laura could not even understand what they were quarreling about. They seemed so angry that she was afraid they would strike each other. Now, there's obviously an element of dark humor here, but this is clearly a dysfunctional family. How does Laura respond? She continues to work through the day. It's her first day on the job, in fact. The hours are long. Her shoulders and neck ache. Her fingers ache, too, from working a needle for hour after hour. But she does the work without complaint. When Pa comes to walk her home at sunset, he asks, How did you like your first day of working for pay, half pint? You make out all right? I think so, she answered. Mrs. White spoke well of my buttonholes. <laughs> she doesn't breathe a word to Pa or anyone else in the family about the extraordinarily uncomfortable position she now finds herself in. She thinks only about the money she could possibly earn for Mary's college. Laura is a tough little girl in On the Banks of Plum Creek. She's a tough young woman in the town on the prairie. The Clancy White household, of course, isn't the only dysfunctional family Wilder depicts in the little house books. There's the Brewster family in these happy golden years, and this mythic scene in the book. Mrs. Brewster and the Butcher Knife. In this scene, Laura is teaching school for the first time, and boarding with Mr. and Mrs. Brewster in an isolated clam shanty 12 miles from home. Laura is just 15. Laura sat straight up. Moonlight was streaming over her bed from the window. Mrs. Brewster screamed again, a wild sound without words that made Laura's scalp crinkle. Here's another wonderful detail for your writers out there. Laura's scalp crinkled. 
Take the knife back to the kitchen, Mr. Brewster said. Laura peeped through the crack between the curtains. The moonlight shone through the candle curtain <coughs> and thinned the darkness so that Laura saw Mrs. Brewster standing there. Her long white flannel nightgown trailed on the floor and her black hair fell loose over her shoulders. In her upraised hand, she held the butcher knife. Ultimately, Mr. Brewster convinces his wife to put the knife away, but Laura spends a sleepless night on the slippery couch behind the curtains just a few feet away from the Brewsters. And in the end, Laura reaches this conclusion. She knew that she must not be afraid. Pa had always said she must never be afraid. Very likely, nothing would happen. She was not exactly afraid of Mrs. Brewster, for she knew that she was quick and strong as a little French horse. That is, when she was awake. But she had never wanted so much to go home. <coughs> Yet, as we all know, Laura finishes the term and she tells her family nothing about that butcher knife. Now, the scene may seem very tame by today's standards in young adult literature. But in the early 1940s, Wilder's depiction of Mrs. Brewster and the butcher knife was both daring and edgy. After she submitted the manuscript to her publisher, her literary agent wrote, Miss Nordstrom is suggesting that Mrs. Brewster's butcher knife incident be cut out. Uh -huh. Ursula Nordstrom was Wilder's editor at Harper & Brothers, her publisher. Ursula Nordstrom went on to become a well-known literary figure in her own right. She edited the work of E.B. White, author of Charlotte's Web, and Maurice Sinda, who gave the world where the wild things are. But as innovative as Ursula Nordstrom went on to become, in 1942, she believed Mrs. Brewster and that <coughs> were pushing the envelope on content for young readers. <coughs> Obviously, Wilder prevailed. The scene remained. But it's significant, I think, that the first edition of these Happy Golden Years, illustrated by <coughs> Helen Sewell and Mildred Boyle, doesn't include an illustration of the scene. An image of Mrs. Brewster, combined with Wilder's narrative, would have given it too much emphasis and been too dark and disturbing for young adults in 1943 at least from the publisher's point of view. This illustration dates from 1953, when Wilder's publisher issued a new edition of Wilder's books, illustrated by Englishman Garth Williams. 10 years after the book's publication, young readers themselves had convinced publishers like Harper and Brothers that darker, grittier content had its place in young adult literature. Still, I think it's really important to note that children's and young adult literature in the 1930s and 1940s, when Wilder wrote The Little House Books, was much more conservative and restrictive than it is today. Such topics as divorce, sexuality, alcoholism, child abuse, these issues became accepted topics in children's books much later through the groundbreaking work of Essie Hinton, Judy Bloom, and Francesca Leah Block in the 1960s, 70s, and 1980s. Even Mary's blindness in the Little House books was a somewhat controversial topic for children's literature in the Depression era. Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, edited her mother's manuscripts, including the final drafts of Pioneer Girl. And she initially discouraged Wilder from including Mary's blindness in the Little House novels. Wilder, however, maintained that a touch of tragedy makes the story truer to life, and showing the way we took it illustrates the spirit of the times and the frontier. In fact, as the fictional Laura Ingalls aged in the series, Wilder fought to keep more mature scenes and episodes in the book over her daughter's objections. Lane apparently believed that teenage main characters had no place in books for young readers in the 1930s and early 1940s. She even suggested that Wilder switch main characters from Laura to Carrie, 
to avoid more adult themes and ideas in the final Little House books. Wilder disagreed. I don't see how we can spare what you call adult stuff, for that makes the story. It was there, and Laura knew and understood it. We can't spoil the story by making it childish. Clearly, by literary standards of the 1930s and 1940s, Wilder didn't whitewash her fiction for young readers. She didn't sanitize her story for them. By writing tough, sometimes dark scenes that dealt with dysfunctional families, disease, and mythic struggles on the frontier, she was blazing a new trail in children's and young adult fiction in the 1930s and 1940s. In fact, Wilder's greatest artistic achievement, The Long Winter, is extraordinarily dark and focuses on the fictional family's struggle against isolation, cold, and starvation. It was very adult stuff for young readers when it was first published in 1940, and it still is. The book's original title was The Hard Winter, but Wilder's publisher feared that title would discourage and perhaps even frighten young readers away from the book. <coughs> With regret, Wilder and even Lane agreed to the new and softer title. So the conventions of children's and young adult literature were far more restrictive during the Depression era and early 40s than they are today. In fact, you could even say that the category of young adult literature wasn't officially recognized <coughs> until 1958, when the American Library Association first began using the term young adult fiction. Wilde herself had died the year before, in 1957, long before the term gained wide acceptance. Now, it is certainly true that Wilder chose not to transfer all the experiences she recorded in Pioneer Girl into her fiction. She didn't write about the birth and death of her baby brother, Charles Frederick, Freddie, as the family called him. He lived only nine months. After a short illness, one awful day he straightened out his little body and was dead. And Wilder chose not to write about the family's decision to move east to Burr Oak, Iowa, after the grasshopper plague in Minnesota had pretty much wiped the family out financially. Charles and Caroline Ingalls briefly managed a hotel in Burr Oak, an enterprise that ultimately failed, and they returned to Minnesota where the family lived in town, not on a farm. Why didn't Wilder choose to write about these experiences in her Little House books? She wrote Lane, it is a story in itself, but does not belong in the picture I am making of the fictional family. In other words, these episodes didn't serve Wilder's larger themes, a frontier family moving west, pursuing agrarian values, <coughs> finding land in the west, and building a new life for themselves there. It wasn't that the material was too adult. Her resistance to include this material from Pioneer Girl was primarily thematic. Still, there's no question that Pioneer Girl contains grittier, more adult material than the Little House books. In the first place, Wilder wrote Pioneer Girl for an adult audience. This was, after all, her memoir, her personal account of her childhood and adolescence written from an adult perspective for adult readers. Wilder hoped to sell Pioneer Girl to a prominent national magazine of the period, perhaps the Saturday Evening Post or the Ladies' Home Journal. In those days, national magazines were a significant market for longer form nonfiction like Pioneer Girl, as well as short and novel length fiction. Magazines serialized longer manuscripts. A memoir like Pioneer Girl might appear in three or four subsequent issues of the Ladies' Home Journal or the Saturday Evening Post. And when longer works of fiction and nonfiction were popular with the magazine's readers, writers could then negotiate a book deal with publishers. In essence, they could sell their manuscripts twice. Something that was especially appealing to both Wilder and Lane during the dark early days of the Depression. 
Wilder finished writing Pioneer Girl in May 1930, a full two years before her first Little House book was published. Now, I'm not going to describe the marketing effort Lane launched to sell her mother's manuscript. Uh, you can read about that in the book. <laughs> but I will say that Wilder chose to write about people, places, and memories that were not only important to her personally, but that would resonate with adult readers in the early 1930s. So, as reviewers and reporters have pointed out, Pioneer Girl indeed contains stark scenes of domestic abuse, love triangles going awry, and a man who lit himself on fire while drunk off whiskey. All of that is there. This is because adult material was appropriate for adult readers in the 1930s. But Wilder, probably on her daughter's advice, apparently felt that some material was inappropriate even for adult readers. In the rough draft version of Pioneer Girl, Wilder includes an especially troubling scene. She and her family are living in Walnut Grove, Minnesota, and once again are struggling to make ends meet. A prosperous family has persuaded Ma to let Laura live in the home of their son and daughter-in-law, Will and Nanny Masters. Nanny suffered from some kind of mysterious fainting spells, and she couldn't adequately care for their little girl. Laura's work was to look out for both the mother and the daughter. As to Will Masters, the husband in this young family, Wilder was uncomfortable around him. She writes, I did not like either to be where Will was. He was drinking more than ever. His eyes were red-rimmed, and he had such a silly look on his face. I hadn't stayed with Nanny very long when one night I waked from a sound sleep to find Will leaning over me. I could smell the whiskey on his breath. I sat up quickly. Is Nanny sick, I asked. No, he answered. Lie down and be still. Go away quick, I said, or I will scream for Nanny. He went, and the next day, Ma said I could come home. Now, a lot is implied in this scene. There's not a lot of description here. But the implication is clear. Laura was threatened with sexual assault. The situation ends well for Laura, and yet this episode was cut from Pioneer Girl in the edited versions Lane typed and later submitted to literary agents and magazine editors later in 1930 and early 1931. The material was too dark, too gritty, too sexually charged for even adult readers in the Depression. So, now that we've cleared the air about the adult material in Pioneer Girl, why is this manuscript important? What did I hope reporters and reviewers would see in Wilder's autobiography? In other words, why does Pioneer Girl matter? What does it reveal about Laura Ingalls Wilder, her work, and her legacy? First, it gives readers new insights into Wilder's childhood and adolescence. Regardless of the grittier, darker elements in Pioneer Girl, Wilder's memoir provides us with more perspective and information about her life in her own voice. Let's return to the birth of her baby brother. Coming home from school one day, we found a strange woman getting supper and a little brother beside Ma in the bed. We were very proud of him and always hurried home from school to see him. He was born on November 1st, 1875. Nine months later, as the English family left Minnesota and moved east, their farm and finances ruined by a relentless grasshopper plague. Freddie took ill. Little brother was not well and the doctor came. I thought that would cure him. But little brother got worse instead of better and one awful day he straightened out his little body and was dead. Yet in the midst of despair, grief, and economic struggle, Wilder gives us this scene just a few pages later when the Ingalls family is living in rooms over a grocery store in Burr Oak. We liked our reading lessons very much and used to practice reading them aloud at nights. Pa knew, but did not tell us until later, that a crowd used to gather in the store beneath 
to hear us read. <laughs> this is one of my favorite images in Pioneer Girl, Laura and Mary reading aloud from The Pied Piper, Paul Revere's Ride, The Village Blacksmith, poems from the independent fifth reader, as townspeople gather below to hear them read. A second reason why Pioneer Girl is important, it illustrates Wilder's natural and instinctive talent as both a writer and a storyteller. <coughs> the question of Wilder's skill and ability as a writer came into question in large part with the publication of this book in 1993, The Ghost in the Little House by William Holtz, a biography of Wilder's daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. It is a well-researched book, and I encourage all of, all of you to read it if you haven't already. But I'm simplifying the book's major premise only slightly when I say it contended that Laura Ingalls Wilder had virtually no talent and that Rose Wilder Lane had ghost-written little house books. Holtz devoted very little attention to Pioneer Girl, which perhaps explains why his depiction of Wilder's talent didn't focus on passages from her original rough draft manuscript that are lyrical, arresting, and clearly reveal her raw talent. Passages like this one. The sun sank lower and lower until looking like a ball of pulsing liquid light, it sank gloriously in clouds of crimson and silver. Cold purple shadows rose in the east, crept slowly around the horizon, then gathered above in depth on depth of darkness from which the stars swung low and bright. Rough draft, unedited, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Now, one isolated passage in a manuscript doesn't necessarily translate to sustained talent. And yet, this passage in Pioneer Girl is important. It showcases Wilder's natural descriptive talent, which Rose Wilder Lane herself admired and praised. I don't see how anybody could improve on your use of words. You are perfect in describing landscape and things. <laughs> but this descriptive passage from the original draft of Pioneer Girl also illustrates what sometimes happens when editors, in this case Rose Wilder Lane, convince writers to revise and change what should <laughs> never be altered. Here's how the opening sentence from the passage appears in the final edited version of Pioneer Girl. The sun sank lower and lower still, a ball of pulsing liquid light, it sank in clouds of crimson and silver. Now, this edit is not radical, yet the passage loses its poetic rhythm and grace. But Wilder's original descriptive passage in Pioneer Girl went on to have yet another life, this time in her novel By the Shores of Silver Lake. Here's how it appears in that book. The sun sank, a ball of pulsing liquid light, it sank in clouds of crimson and silver. Again, the edit is very subtle, but it lacks the original's natural rhythm and grace as well. But except for these opening lines you see on the screen, Wilder returned to her original passage in Pioneer Girl for the rest of the description as it appears in Silver Lake. Let's take one more look at Wilder's original opening line from that description in Pioneer Girl. The sun sank lower and lower until looking like a ball of pulsing liquid light, it sank gloriously in clouds of crimson and silver. This original line has movement, both in the scene it describes and the rhythm of the words. Furthermore, this is a kind of technical issue for all of you in the audience who are writing geeks. Wilder uses an adverb here, the word gloriously. Now, usually adverbs are never a writer's friend, but here Wilder uses it brilliantly and perfectly. This is why adverbs exist. But this passage had yet another life, this time in Rose Wilder Lane's pioneer novel, Free Land. This book borrows heavily from Pioneer Girl. It was published in 1938. And here's Lane's take on Wilder's original passage. 
sunset spread in rainbow colors around the level rim of the earth and purple shadows rose. The low stars were huge and quivering. The description here is flat and dull. It lacks the visual immediacy and impact of her mother's rough draft, unedited, original passage. If Lane was truly the ghost writer of the Little House books, why do her pioneer novels lack the lyricism, beauty, and distinctive voice readers find in many passages in Pioneer Girl and throughout the Little House books themselves? Now, on to point number three, why Pioneer Girl matters. It reveals Wilder's growth as a writer. Her transformation from a newspaper columnist to memoirist to novelist. Lauren Goss Wilder launched her professional writing career in 1911, first as a columnist and then as a page editor for the Missouri Ruralist Agricultural Newspaper, the largest farm publication in Missouri during the early 20th century. By the way, the Ruralist is still around today, online. Wilder's work was ultimately very successful, so successful that the Missouri Ruralist published a profile about her in 1918. Here's what her editor said about her then. She knows farm folks and their problems as few women who write know them. And having sympathy with the folks whom she serves, she writes well. In Pioneer Girl, readers can see that Wilder, at least initially, wrote like a newspaper columnist. Episodes are short, intense, every word mattered, because newspaper columnists unlike novelists or memoirists, have to make every word count. They don't have a lot of real estate. They don't have a lot of physical space in which to develop their stories. Here's what I mean. Let's look at the passage that opens Pioneer Girl. Once upon a time, years and years ago, Pa stopped the horses in the wagon they were hauling away out on the prairie in Indian territory. Well, Caroline, he said, here's the place we've been looking for. Might as well camp. So Pa and Ma got down from the wagon. Pa unhitched the horses and picketed them, tied them to long ropes fastened to wooden pegs driven in the ground so they could eat the grass. Then he made the campfire and out of bits of willow twigs by the, from the creek nearby. <coughs> Ma cooked supper over the fire, and after we had eaten, Sister Mary and I were put to bed in the wagon, and Pa and Ma sat a while by the fire. Pa would bring the horses and tie them to the wagon before he and Ma came to sleep in the wagon, too. I lay and looked through the opening in the wagon over it. I lay and looked through the opening in the wagon cover at the campfire, and Pa and Ma sitting there. It was lonesome and so still with the stars shining down on the great flat land where no one lived. There was a long, scared sound off in the night and Pa said it was a wolf howling. It frightened me a little, but we were safe in the wagon with its night's tight cover to keep out the wind and the rain. The wagon was home. We had lived in it so long, and Pa's rifle was hanging at the side where he could get it quickly to shoot the wolf. He wouldn't let wolves nor anything hurt us. And Jack, the brindle bulldog, was lying under the wagon guarding us too. And so we fell asleep. The opening passage reads like a newspaper column. It tells a single story effectively while using a minimum number of words and a minimum amount of space. But as Wilder's confidence grew, as she began to understand that a memoirist didn't need to restrict herself to a tight word count for every scene and every narrative, Pioneer Girl begins to include more elaborate and well-developed scenes. Let's take a look at the following passage from Pioneer Girl, which appears later in the narrative, when the first wave of grasshoppers, actually they were locusts, sweeps through the Ingalls family's farm on Plum Creek. The weather was just right and the crops grew and grew. At dinner one day, Paul was telling us that the weed in our field was so tall, it would just stand under his arms with long, beautiful heads and filling nicely. He said the grain was all soft and milky, yet but was so well grown he felt sure we would have a wonderful crop. 
Just then we heard someone call, and Mrs. Nelson was in the doorway. She was all out of breath and running, wringing her hands and almost crying, the grasshoppers are coming, the grasshoppers are coming, she, creep, she shrieked, come and look. We all ran to the door and looked around. Now and then a grasshopper dropped on the ground, but we couldn't see anything to be excited about. Look at the sun, yes, look at the sun, cried Mrs. Nelson, pointing to the sky. We raised our faces and looked into the sun. It had been shining brightly, but now there was a light-colored fleece, fleecy cloud over its face, so it did not hurt our eyes. And then we saw that the cloud was grasshoppers, their wings a shiny white, making a screen between us and the sun. They were dropping to the ground like hail in a hailstorm, faster and faster. This is just the beginning of the scene. It continues for several pages. But notice Wilder's vivid and colorful description. We raised our faces and looked straight into the sun, a <coughs> light-colored, fleecy cloud. The phrasing is memorable, too. The grasshoppers hit the ground like hail in a hailstorm, faster and faster. <coughs> and perhaps because of her experience as a newspaper columnist, she intersperses description with dialogue that is believable. It sounds the way real people talk. Wilder combines all these elements here to write a longer, multi-page episode. She's writing long-form nonfiction here, not a tightly constructed newspaper column. On the other hand, Pioneer Girl shows us just how much Wilder grew as a novelist once she understood the freedom writing fiction could give her. Here, for example, is a single sentence from Pioneer Girl. Pa built a house of logs from the trees in the nearby creek bottom, and when we moved into it, there was a hole in the wall where the window was to be, and a quilt hung over the doorway to keep the weather out. In Little House on the Prairie, Wilder's third novel in the Little House series, she devoted an entire chapter to the construction of that house Pa built of logs. And yet another chapter to moving into that house, plus a chapter on two stout doors, and chapters on the construction of the fireplace, and building the roof and floor for this house. From one sentence in Pioneer Girl, with the confidence of a novelist, Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote five chapters, five chapters from one sentence, about that little house on the prairie in her third novel. Which brings me to yet another reason why Pioneer Girl is important. Pioneer Girl serves as the foundation for Wilder's Little House books. Wilder and Lane apparently abandoned their attempt to publish the manuscript in 1933, when their literary agency entered it in the Atlantic Monthly Little Brown Writing Contest. But Pioneer Girl didn't win. And yet, Wilder went on to use the manuscript as an outline for the rest of the Little House series. She drew heavily from passages, scenes, descriptions, and characters in Pioneer Girl. They often found their way into the Little House books. When Rose Wilder Lane moved to Columbia, Missouri in the mid-1930s to research a book of her own, she took Pioneer Girl with her, and Wilder requested the return of sections of the manuscript as she worked on By the Shores of Silver Lake, her fifth novel. As she wrote to Lane in 1937, thank you for the pages from Pioneer Girl. They will help. Wilder even borrowed an episode from Pioneer Girl for Farmer Boy, her novel about her husband's childhood on a farm near Malone, New York. In Pioneer Girl, Wilder recounts the story of a young schoolmaster, William H. Reed, a slim young man who inherited a schoolhouse of big, unruly boys who had started fights with previous teachers and driven them away. The leader of the gang of boys in Pioneer Girl was a bully named Mose, who, according to Wilder, was the worst of the lot. Mr. Reed sat in his chair by his desk with his ruler in one hand, idly spatting it against the other. It was a large, flat, very strong ruler he had just made. Mose was the last one in. 
He was ready to fight and came swaggering up, expecting Mr. Reed to stand up so he could knock him down. But Mr. Reed sat still, just as Moe stood in front of him, reached up with his left hand, grabbed Moe's by the collar and jerked, tripping him with his foot at the same time and laid him neatly across his knees. <laughs> it all happened so quickly, and Moe's was so surprised that before he knew what had happened, he lay there like a bad little boy and was being soundly spanked with the flat, strong ruler. <laughs> Mose is so humiliated that he doesn't return to the school, neither do the other boys in his gang, and from that day forward, Mr. Reed runs an efficient and peaceful school. Now, in Farmer Boy, the teacher's name is Mr. Course. He, too, is described as a pale young man who isn't big enough to fight the big bad boys El Manzo meets on his first day of school. They had come to thrash the teacher and break up the school. The leader of this fictional gang is a tough, mean young man named Bill Ritchie. Now, in the fictional version of the story, the slim, pale, but competent school teacher faces Bill down with a black snake ox whip 15 feet long. <laughs> the thin, long lash coiled around Bill's legs and Mr. Course jerked. Bill lurched and almost fell. Quick as black lightning, the lash circled and struck and coiled again and again. The image of that whip is far more dramatic than the ruler in Pioneer Girl, but the outcome is the same. The big boys were licked. Mr. Course had licked Bill Ritchie's gang. And in the process, an episode from Pioneer Girl found its way into a novel about young Almanzo Wilder. Rose Wilder Lane also used material from Pioneer Girl in several short stories, published in the Ladies Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post, and then incorporated into her book, Old Hometown, and of course, her two pioneer novels, Let the Hurricane Roar and Free Land. While her mother wrote about Big Jerry and By the Shores of Silver Lake, for example, Lane wrote about Half-Breed Jack and Free Land. And Lane's main characters in Let the Hurricane Roar were named Charles and Caroline. <coughs> he played the fiddle, and she was a quiet person. <coughs> Her face was quiet under smooth wings of hair, and all her movements were gentle and deft. Lane's main characters in this book took their personalities, as well as their names, from Pioneer Girl. So Pioneer Girl is indeed a somewhat grittier, somewhat edgier <coughs> account of Laura Ingalls Wilder's childhood and adolescence, but for good reason. And it's an important addition to Laura Ingalls Wilder's literary legacy. It gives us new insight into her growth and development, both as a novelist and as the literary legend she has since become. Pioneer Girl is, as one reviewer aptly described it, <coughs> a treasure. So thank you all very much. And I believe I have time for some questions. There are two microphones, so if you raise your hand, we'll pass the mic, and there's one on that side. So if you have a question, raise your hand, we'll pass the mic. The question about Freddie's grave still remains inconclusive. Um, when I was working on Pioneer Girl, um, I certainly looked into this. I consulted another very well-known expert on Wilder um, scholarship, William Anderson, and he concluded 
along with me that her, um, her brother's grave is unmarked and remains unknown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My wife is the big uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder enthusiast, not myself, but uh, my image always was that she was sort of like Grandma Moses, started uh, her art late in life with no training and, and so on. And I was uh, shocked to learn that she was an accomplished newspaper woman uh, for 20 years or so before she started. Why is that uh, such a closely held secret? Why didn't, why wasn't she applauded for her newspaper work? I never heard of it before. That's a very good question. Um, and you're not alone in um, clinging to that image of, of Laura Ingalls Wilder as being an untrained writer who simply wrote down the facts of her life um, as she remembered them and became an instant star. I think in part the reason why that myth has persisted is because it is such a wonderful story. <laughs> and it's so encouraging to so many people who want to write and, and are working very diligently and hard hoping for a book to be published. But I also have come to believe that in part uh, Wilder's work for the Missouri Ruralist was unrecognized until recently and there, there's a really fine book edited by Stephen Hines uh, and published by the University of Missouri Press that includes um, a selection of her um, columns for the ruralist. But I think in part it's because she was writing for an agricultural newspaper. Um, she did write for a couple of articles for McCall's and The Country Gentleman, three in total, um, in 1919 and the early 1920s, but Marcus Wilder didn't enjoy writing for that market at all. And so she really preferred to write to an audience that she understood, and she understood the farm audience in Missouri very well. She and her husband had established Rocky Ridge Farm, worked hard to nurture and make that land viable, so she knew that she was writing with a certain amount of credibility to people that she understood. And yet I think a lot of critics and early historians uh, initially dismissed Wilder's agricultural newspaper writing because it was just that, it was writing for um, a very regional, very s relatively small group of people um, and a smaller audience. However, I think what's really interesting, and, and I discuss this more fully in my biography, um, the circulation for the Missouri Ruralist grew dramatically during those years that Laura Ingalls Wilder was a, a regular featured columnist and editor. Not necessarily because of Wilder's work itself, but because the magazine was really taking root and finding new ways to express itself to its audience. And I will say this, that in recent years, more and more scholarship has been devoted to Wilder's work as a journalist, and I think now people are beginning to understand just what an important foundation it laid for her as a professional writer. I'm interested in some of the technical ways you approach the material for editing. When you first uh, took on the material, was it all typed or digitized, or did you actually work with the big cheap tablets? That is a great question. <laughs> um, there are several different versions of um, Pioneer Girl. Um, the version that I chose to use for the annotated autobiography, and the one that I quoted from most extensively in my biography, was Wilder's original draft, which was in fact handwritten on those big cheap tablets. My first exposure to the manuscript came in um, 2006 and 2007, and um, I could not look at the original manuscripts. They are um, safely guarded in a climate-controlled space. You can imagine just how fragile those manuscripts are at this point. Um, so I um, looked at the manuscript on microfilm from the University of Missouri. And I made Xerox copies from microfilm. And that's what I read and worked from on the biography. It was really tough going, I have to tell you. It was very, I mean, not only is it difficult to read someone else's handwriting, but on microfilm and pencil, on tablet paper, it's just really hard to read. 
Uh, but for this time around, um, in the interim between um, between 2006 and 2011, when we really started working on Pioneer Girl in earnest, uh, the Missouri, the University of Missouri, had a digitized copy that was somewhat clearer. It was certainly much clearer than my Xerox copy made from that microphone. And um, using a digitized copy, a valiant and talented and persistent um, assistant editor at the South Dakota State Historical Society Press, Roger Hartley, made a typewritten transcript. And he was very, very careful. He made all kinds of marginal notes and footnotes that indicated uh, where Wilder had crossed something out, or where a page uh, shifted from the front to the back and then back to the front again. And so with Roger's terrific transcript, it made my job ever so much easier. Thank you. There's a question right up here. Do you believe, after looking through her work and expanding everything, that there's more undiscovered gems from her, or have we possibly seen the last with Pioneer Girl of her original work? There is one more book, and it's coming out next year. It'll be edited by William Anderson, and it's a, it's a collection of her correspondence. So that's coming out next year. Um, and I just, um, I saw Bill Anderson at um, Laura Palooza in Brookings. We were both speakers there. Um, if you don't know what Laura Palooza is, to ask a question and I will tell you. <laughs> and um, he feels confident that with the publication of the correspondence um, that will come out next year, this is the last of the material that we will have from her. So stay tuned for that book. I know it's going to be terrific. Um, other questions? I had a question, actually. Over here. Over here, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are these bright lights I can't see. Um, I've always been sort of curious about the place of Farmer Boy in the, in the collection of her work. I, I recently read a book where um, Wendy McClure, who wrote The Water Life, talked about how she thought of um, um, Farmer Boy as being like an idealized version of a childhood, and that's how what Lauren Goldwater was writing, especially in, in her depictions of the plentiful food that was available to him. And I was curious what your thoughts are, were on that and um, just what kind of doing the Pioneer Girl Project taught you about that. I think that's a great question. And, and actually, I describe uh, Farmer Boy in more detail in uh, my biography, Lauren Wells Wilder, a, a Writer's Life. My take on, on Farmer Boy is that it's kind of the mirror image of Little House in the Big Woods. When Laura Ingalls Wilder um, originally sold Little House in the Big Woods, she sold it to Alfred Knopf, and they offered her a three-book deal. Publishing hasn't changed that much since the early 1930s, and just as Laura Ingalls Wilder was about to sign the contract for that three-book deal, Alfred Knopf decided to close its children's department. And her editor at Knopf advised Wilder not to sign the contract. And I won't go into the whole big long story about that. It's, it's quite fascinating. But ultimately, when she signed her contract with Harper and Brothers, just a few months later, it was just for one book. And I don't think that Laura was Wilder had really envisioned a full series at this point. So she finished Little House in the Big Woods. She still had, you know, that multi-book deal in her mind, and so she turned her attention to writing a book about her husband's childhood. So she wrote one about her childhood, she wrote one about his childhood, hers was primarily for girl readers, Farmer Boy was for boys, and his story could contrast very nicely with hers because they were from a much more prosperous family. Um, they were in a more settled part of the country. Their experiences were different. So I really feel that Farmer Boy and um, Little House in the Big Woods can almost be read as a set. What I think is dynamic and unique about Farmer Boy is that Laura Ingalls Wilder's confidence as a novelist is growing in Farmer Boy. 
and she creates a main character who is really the center of all the action. In Little House in the Good Woods, we think about Laura as being the main character, but really it's a family story. If you look at it, the whole family is engaged here. And I think if you simply read Little House in the Big Woods without knowing all the other Little House books were coming, you might assume this was indeed a family story, that uh, Pa was just as much a main character as, as Laura is, for example. So I think those two books are kind of a set. And then as Laura Ingalls Wilder became more confident about her abilities as a novelist, when she created a character like Almanzo in Farmer Boy, around which all the action uh, centers, who has his own hopes and dreams and aspirations that really fill the pages of that book. Um, I think then she was ready to think about, oh, maybe there are more books in me. And that's when she began work on uh, Little House on the Prairie. And if you read Little House on the Prairie, Laura clearly emerges as the main character there. So it's really interesting, I think, to see her progress as a novelist in those first three books. So thanks for asking that question. I like to it, as you can tell. <laughs> You've wet my curiosity with two of the questions that have been asked. First, do we know what Freddie died from? And secondly, would you tell a little more about Laura Palooza? Okay. <laughs> Sadly, we don't really know what um, Freddie died of. He died on the train. Um, his family was in movement then. And in the 19th century, it was sometimes difficult to ascertain exactly what was the cause of death or what caused Mary's blindness, for example. Um, although we now have a better feeling and sense of what probably was at the root of Mary's blindness. You can read about that in Pioneer Girl. Um, as to Laura Palooza, it is a conference that meets every other year, generally, um, and it brings together serious Wilder scholars, amateur scholars, fans, together to discuss Laura Ingalls Wilder, to read and share papers, to talk about their experiences with Wilder and her work. And um, the next Laura Palooza will be in 2017 in Springfield, Missouri, my hometown. And I'm sure there will be trips to Rocky Ridge Farm, where Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote Pioneer Girl and all the little house books. And uh, there are several people who were at Laura Palooza in the audience today. There are two or three of you. You want to hold up your hands? So we have two Laura Palooza alums here. So if you want more about Laura Palooza, see these two or see me afterward. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is delightful listening to you and, and you enjoy you. that very much. So What's much. next? Where are you going next in terms of your writing? Um, well, right now I'm taking a break from nonfiction. <laughs> um, it is so liberating to write fiction again. So, um, my agent is marketing a young adult novel right now, and I'm working on um, a second young adult novel about the Civil War. I, my, first novel, A Voice from the Border, was published several years ago, and that's a period of time that really intrigues me. So I'm going back into the Civil War, that's what I'm working on right now. I am thinking about a possible book on Lauren Ingalls Wilder, but it's still kind of shadowy and it hasn't taken shape yet, so we'll see if that happens. On that note, um, thank you for coming. If you would like your book signed, or if you'd like to continue the dialogue with Pamela, she'll be in the lobby. So thank you for coming. Let's thank our <laughs> Safe travels, everyone. <laughs>